Item number, SCP-20. Object class, Keter. Special containment procedures. Samples of SCP-20 are stored in a series of sealed cultivation chambers inside a sealed containment room at Biological Research Area 12, which is accessible only via airlock. Nutrients are administered via automated robotic systems, as the cultivation chamber must remain sealed at all times. Hermetically sealed video surveillance cameras are installed within the containment room and must be checked daily for integrity. Any personnel entering the containment room must wear biosafety level 5 equipment, including rebreathers and undergo full antifungal disinfection upon exiting. Description SCP-20 is a fast-spreading fungal organism that is capable of affecting the senses and behavior of living creatures, including humans. Samples of SCP-20 exhibit an unknown effect that renders them effectively invisible to direct observation, even when under a microscope. SCP-20 is only visible to humans when viewed through photographic or video surveillance. Once SCP-20 forms a colony, usually within a human residence, it will produce spores that affect the behavior of humans around it. Affected subjects will increase the heat and humidity within their homes to create an environment more suitable to the growth of SCP-20. Affected subjects also become more sociable in many cases and often invite acquaintances to their homes to further spread the organism. As the spores and mold colonies are invisible to affected subjects, the mold may sometimes grow directly on living subjects. As the spores and colonies within a home approach critical concentration, the health of affected human subjects will rapidly deteriorate, resulting in death. Further spread of the mold may occur as the bodies of any deceased subjects are encountered by emergency responders and healthcare agents, as well as transportation of the bodies to local morgues. SCP-20 was first encountered in where an undercover SCP agent noted dramatic personality changes in personnel working at the local hospital. Upon investigation by a containment team, it was discovered that almost civilians had been infected, as well as a majority of the town. The civilian population was terminated, and the town incinerated under cover of a local flash forest fire. To date, over 12 outbreaks of SCP-20 have been reported. Investigations are currently underway to determine the source of these outbreaks and possible preventative measures. Addendum 20-01 Excerpts from the audio-video mission recorders of Mobile Task Force Ada-10 See No Evil During the initial containment of SCP-20 on T2 Lead Team 2 moving to the Red House T2 Com Copy UAV-1 is picking up one heat signature. T2 lead. Team 2 in place, ready to br- T2-2, door opening. At this point, a civilian woman appeared in the doorway, holding a kitchen knife. Video surveillance showed that nearly two-thirds of her face was covered by mold growths. Civilian woman. Well, hello there, gentlemen. Care to take a breather inside? T2 lead. On the ground, drop the weapon. Civilian woman. Don't be silly. Come on in and stay a while. T2 lead. Stop where you are. Drop the weapon. Civilian woman. We... We just want to have some guests. Please, come in. T2-2. Drop that weapon. It is assumed that at this point, the infected civilian noticed T2-4 carrying a primed incendiary weapon and lunged forward at the team members with the knife. Civilian woman. Data expunged. T2 lead. Open fire! Open fire! Gunfire. Screaming. Item number. SCP-059. Object class. Keter. Special containment procedures. A single specimen of SCP-059 is kept at Site 11B inside a graded Z laminate shielding box composed of depleted uranium, tantalum, tin, steel, copper, and aluminum. Surrounding SCP-059's containment box is a 7 meter by 7 meter by 7 meter area, sealed as a level 4 biohazard area, and surrounded by 3 centimeters of lead shielding. This area is to be sprayed daily with a solution of methyl isothiocyanate to prevent overgrowth of SCP-059-1. 
Personnel entering an SCP-059 affected area are cautioned to wear appropriate biohazard protection, as well as Type K-59-B radiation shielding. They are to remain in the area for no more than 15 minutes, as the radiation shielding is only partially effective. SCP-059-1 infestations found in the wild should be contained by removing the SCP-059 specimen responsible and incineration of all observed SCP-059-1. Large underground infestations are best neutralized by fuel-air thermobaric explosives. Additional specimens of SCP-059 are not needed for experimentation and should be transported to Site 11B for incineration by Plasma Arc at 10,000 Kelvin. Description SCP-059 is a radioactive mineral of unknown origin, superficially resembling shelite. A component of SCP-059 is believed to originate in an alternate universe and to be responsible for its anomalous properties, in addition to alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. SCP-059 specimens produce a previously unknown type of radiation, apparently unique to the object, tentatively designated Delta Radiation. Delta Radiation is accompanied by Cherenkov Radiation, visible as a blue glow. Delta Radiation is only partially contained by standard radiation shielding. The best results have been obtained using Grade Z laminate shielding with an additional super-dense metal layer. This reduces the effective range of Delta Radiation from approximately 20 meters to approximately 6 meters. When an area is exposed to delta radiation for more than 15 minutes, an unknown species of fungus, designated SCP-059-1, begins to grow on any exposed surface. This fungus does not require any standard nutrition, but will die within 24 hours of removal from a delta radiation source. SCP-059-1 is itself radioactive, but does not emit delta radiation. However, if a critical mass of SCP-051-1 is allowed to grow, delta radiation from an unknown source other than SCP-059 will appear in the area, further supporting SCP-059-1's growth. Interested readers may consult Dr. for his theories of space-time stress and merger of alternate realities. Within 18 hours, the infected mass will become transparent and disappear, presumably into the universe that is a source of delta radiation. The process then continues, with SCP-059-1 infecting new material. SCP-059-1 will infest both living beings and inanimate objects. Humans and animals infected with SCP-059-1 become immune to the effects of ionizing radiation, but progressively merge with SCP-059-1 and eventually have all tissues replaced by fungal growth. While generally non-violent, they will attempt to expose unaffected individuals to SCP-059. SCP-059-1 infections do not appear to be directly contagious, but only spread by contact with Delta radiation. However, long-term exposure to SCP-059-1 has not been adequately tested to rule out considering it a biohazard, as well as a known radiation hazard. Infected individuals still capable of communication describe seeing a world entirely covered with SCP-059-1, where much of the surface is composed of SCP-059. It is unclear whether this is a hallucination or a view into the source of SCP-059. Infectees are generally pleased with their condition and often refer to being in the blue light of heaven. SCP-059-1 is affected by most fungicides but new growth will continue as long as SCP-059 is present. Early stage SCP-059-1 infection in humans may be treated with Griseofulvin. However, the treatment is 90% likely to lead to death by radiation poisoning. Treated individuals lose their immunity to radiation and will already have absorbed a now lethal dose prior to treatment. Late stage treatment should not be attempted as too much tissue will already be converted to SCP-059-1. The remains of failed treatments should be kept out of range of SCP-059. Otherwise, data expunged. SCP-059 specimens have been discovered in eight different underground locations across a range of 5,000 kilometers. No pattern has emerged for their appearance. Specimens range from 1 to 10 kilograms in size and are not part of the normal rock formations in the areas where they have been found. Addendum 
Dr. has recorded and analyzed the patterns of radiation emitted by the contained SCP-059-1 colony and believes SCP-059-1 may be sapient and attempting to communicate via controlled emissions of radiation. Initial attempts to analyze this language reveal data expunged. Item Number SCP-129 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-129 is at large in the world and infects large numbers of humans and animals daily. As such, containment efforts are focused on treatment of infected individuals and on eradication of any or all member species of SCP-129. Although at least 98% of the world's population harbors a natural immunity to one or more species of SCP-129, outbreaks that reach stage 3 or higher must be contained as quickly as possible, with infected individuals quarantined under highest risk contagion protocols. In the event of stage 4 or stage 5 outbreak, in addition to the above procedures, data expunged. Description SCP-129 is a series of different species of fungus that can infect any animal with mucosal membranes. Infection by SCP-129 can pass through up to five stages. Depending on exposure to further member species of SCP-129, individual resistance, and other factors, with each stage of infection facilitating progression to the next stage by weakening the individual's resistance to subsequent infection. Due to a combination of historical events, most humans and animals are naturally immune to SCP-1294 through SCP-129. Therefore, outbreaks of stage 3 infections are quite rare, but have the potential for widespread infection if not swiftly isolated and contained. All known cases of SCP-129 have followed a five-stage progression, although data expunged, possibly due to mutation. Stage 1 The first organism, SCP-129-1, attacks the victim's mucosal membranes, multiplying quickly and unobtrusively. A faint yeast-like smell might be detected, but beyond that, SCP-129-1 is asymptomatic. A second organism, SCP-129-2, can then infect the host, causing the victim to experience symptoms identical to those of acute viral nasopharyngitis, the common cold. The decreased efficacy of the host's immune system due to infection from SCP-129-2 allows SCP-129-1 to become entrenched further. SCP-129-1 and 2 generally leave the host body within four to six days. Though both species are fairly widespread, and most of the population has little to no protection against either organism. They pose little danger themselves, except to facilitate infection by SCP-129-3. Stage 2 Although SCP-129-3 is usually stopped by natural mucus, Stage 1 infection changes the composition of the host's mucus so that the host is significantly less resistant to SCP-129-3. Once established in the host, SCP-1293 alters the host's mucus, lymph, and blood such that other species of SCP-129 can thrive in the host. Symptoms of Stage 2 infection include greatly increased mucus production, a nagging cough due to excess phlegm, a lingering low-grade fever, increased sweating and salivating, a somewhat increased preference for vegetables, and the complaint that certain fruit juices taste odd. Infection by SCP-1293 generally lasts anywhere from two weeks to four months before being driven out by the immune system, unless the host enters stage 3 infection. At least 1% of all humans have experienced stage 2 infection at some point, but due to natural immunities, in spite of stage 2 infection and the relative rarity of stage 3 species, few have passed into stage 3. Stage 3 in the absence of SCP-1293, nearly all animals are immune to the three species that cause stage 3 infection. However, a small number of stage 2 victims can become infected with one or more of these species. In these cases, the fungal infections become entrenched in the host and cannot be removed without extraordinary measures. Individually, the three stage 3 species elicit different symptoms in the host. SCP-1294 causes increased tear production. Lacrimation, slight yellowing of the eyes. SCP-1295 causes the host's nails to thicken and significantly increases earwax production. SCP-1296 data expunged. 
in particular, bright yellow urine and small pellets in the host's feces, both of which smell strongly of yeast. However, a victim who becomes infected with all three of these species will, within hours, develop flu-like, or worse, symptoms and become bedridden for three to five weeks. Afterward, though the victim appears to have recovered fully, in actuality, SCP-129 has spread throughout all systems in the host's body, marking passage into Stage 4. Stage 4 Victims who reach Stage 4 appear generally healthy and indeed may be more lively and energetic than at any time since first contracting SCP-129. In actuality, SCP-129-1-6 through have spread throughout the host's body, completely infiltrating the subject's immune, respiratory, circulatory, reproductive, and central nervous systems. Mycelia from SCP-129 species also permeate the host's skin and replace some percentage of the host's hair. These hyphae, which are nearly indistinguishable from the host's natural hair, are used to propagate SCP-129 to other hosts. Any potential host that comes into contact with Shedoff Hyphae has an extremely high chance of becoming infected with SCP-129. Hyphae seem to be equally contagious from any part of the host's body. Despite, or perhaps because of, increased susceptibility to SCP-129, Stage 4 victims are much more resistant to viral and bacterial pathogens than uninfected subjects. All known subjects who have reached Stage 4 have either progressed to Stage 5 or died within weeks. Stage 5 Symptoms of Stage 5 infection depend on a variety of factors, including the particular Stage 5 species that are present, as well as genetic, physiological, environmental, and any number of unknown factors. However, as in Stage 4, all Stage 5 victims are highly contagious and can infect victims who had previously shown complete immunity. Notable Manifestations of Stage 5 Symptoms February Witnesses riding in a commuter train car described a woman suddenly blowing up like a balloon and exploding, but instead of blood and viscera, the contents of the car were covered in spores and filaments. Analysis later showed that the victim was infected with SCP-1299, SCP-1294, and SCP-129. All persons and objects in the affected area were quarantined, euthanized, and incinerated per protocol. Several casualties, including Foundation personnel. May Following a string of disappearances in data expunged were tracked to a cave several kilometers from town. Inside, investigators found several pulsating mounds of flesh and vegetative material. Although most were unrecognizable, a few of the entities retained some human characteristics and were identified as some of the missing citizens. Researchers theorized that victims of this combination of SCP-129 would interact normally with the populace, attempting to infect others, until, after a period of time, they would come to the cave. How and why they were brought here is not known. Upon arrival, the victims would be changed into the pulsating vegetative flesh mounds, which appear to be organisms modified to provide a long-term source of sustenance for SCP-129. Analysis suggests the flesh mounds could potentially live for several years. Autopsy revealed the presence of SCP-12910, SCP-12911, SCP-12914, and SCP-129. Site quarantined and sanitized per protocol. Item number SCP-306 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Frozen samples of SCP-306 are stored at Bioresearch Site 101. Research on SCP-306 is to be carried out under Biosafety Level 4 protocols. Subjects infected with SCP-306 are to be immediately placed under quarantine. Any items making physical contact with infected subjects or SCP-306 residue are to be incinerated. Personnel interacting with infected subjects are to remain in full hazmat containment suits. Personnel interacting with infected subjects or SCP-306 residue are to remain under mandatory quarantine and submit to twice-daily examination for a period of two weeks after interaction. Containment breaches within controlled environments will result in lockdown of affected area. 
personnel within the affected area are to remain in place until cleared for release. Hazmat teams are to remove and examine personnel for signs of infection. Infected personnel are to be quarantined. Affected area is to then be sterilized. A one kilometer radius around any areas experiencing an outbreak of SCP-306 is to be quarantined. Areas are to have all water and sewer systems sealed. Hazmat teams are to be deployed in the area, and all persons in the quarantine zone are to be evacuated and screened for infection. Uninfected persons are to be released, with non-Foundation employees administered Class B amnestics. Infected persons are to be terminated. Following completed evacuation, enclosed areas are to be sterilized with ethylene oxide. In unenclosed areas, controlled burning, followed by a ground sweep, are to be enacted. Wetlands harboring SCP-306 are to be impounded, filled, and sealed with concrete. Preventing SCP-306 from infecting any large body of water is an Alpha Class priority. Description SCP-306 is a fungus related to the genus Trichophyton. SCP-306 can infect humans through inhalation of spores or by skin-to-skin -skin contact. Initial symptoms of infection can include coughing and sneezing and skin lesions. Lesions caused by SCP-306 display a morphology similar to benign papillomas, warts, and reach full size after approximately two days. Lesions are prone to shedding, after which another lesion forms underneath. Lesions that fall from the body of infected subjects are light enough to be carried by wind and capable of spreading SCP-306 for years. If untreated, Lesions caused by SCP-306 can cover the body within two weeks. SCP-306 has been shown to grow in nearly all biological matter. SCP-306's primary anomalous property will only manifest when growing on human tissue. When infecting a human, SCP-306 secretes several previously unknown enzymes. These enzymes catalyze an unknown process which drastically alters the structure of cells, resulting in the formation of several extra organelles of an indeterminate function. Approximately two weeks following infection, infected subjects begin to develop major physiological modifications. Over the course of the next three weeks, subjects rapidly lose weight, followed by the development of abnormal pigmentation and increased water permeability of skin. Subjects who are still able to speak describe being in constant, excruciating pain. Over the next two to five months, symptoms include Shrinkage of organ systems Reshaping of the skeletal system This process can last between two and five months, after which subjects are referred to as SCP-3061. Instances of SCP-3061, on average, weigh 25 to 30 kilograms, measuring 0.5 meters in length. SCP-3061 have an appearance similar to amphibians, but correspond to no known species. Autopsies of deceased SCP-3061 specimens have revealed that internal structures remain morphologically similar to human organs following metamorphosis. Instances appear to enjoy human presence and actively attempt to gain contact when in human presence. SCP-3061 remain extremely infectious, with any direct physical contact resulting in infection by SCP-306. SCP-3061 are capable of reproduction, in a similar manner to Agalichnus calidryas. SCP-306 was discovered in Louisiana in a swampy area when locals reported a colony of unknown amphibious creatures, coupled with a string of unexplained disappearances. Foundation agents were deployed to the scene to investigate, leading to the object's discovery. Since this event, additional SCP-306 outbreaks have been found in the southeastern United States. SCP-306 is resistant to nearly all treatment, with the exception of high heat. Cauterization of infected tissue has shown modest success in treating cutaneous infection. However, respiratory infection is not treatable. 
Addendum 1. Testing on SCP-306 has shown the fungus to be able to grow in nearly all biological matter, including most vertebrates. However, only humans have been shown to develop any deleterious effects from infection. Due to the possibility of a major outbreak, Dr. is requesting increased funding for research into SCP-306. Addendum 2. Memo from Site Director. Based off of Dr. B's research into SCP-306, we now consider it extremely likely that large reservoirs of SCP-306 exist in the wild. Because of both the physical danger and danger to secrecy presented, all sites are advised to monitor for wild SCP-306 reservoirs. Any confirmed vectors are to be dealt with by applicable regional forces. Addendum 3. As of date undisclosed, Site has reported decreased efficacy of antifungal sprays used to combat SCP-306. O-5-6 has authorized further testing to determine the cause of this change. Addendum 4. Incident I-3063. On date undisclosed, all 12 contained instances of SCP-3061 escaped primary containment during routine feeding. Researcher Thompson was fatally injured by a stray bullet as security subdued the specimens. The following is a transcript of an interview conducted with researcher Phyllis immediately following the breach. Interviewed Researcher Phyllis Interviewer Agent Leonard Begin Log Leonard, thank you for being here on short notice. Phyllis Sure Leonard all right, first order of business. Please state what you were doing when the breach occurred. Phyllis. Well, I was conducting feeding for the 306-1 specimens. What's his name? Uh, Thompson was getting the feed, and I was going to administer it. I did a count of the specimens. There were 11, but that was wrong, because there should have been 12. So I told Thompson to look at the logs and see if one had been moved to another site. All of a sudden, there's this flash of motion. And next thing I know, I'm being pinned down by some of the specimens. I don't remember what happened after that. When I woke up, they were gone, and security was already there. Thompson was lying on the ground bleeding from his mouth. The guards escorted me out. Leonard, so you were attacked by the specimens. Phyllis, basically. Leonard, I understand that these creatures are normally quite docile. What caused this aggressive behavior? Phyllis. Okay. We've been performing some new testing on the specimens. Leonard. What kind of testing? Phyllis. Intelligence testing. Putting them through mazes, training them, that sort of thing. Leonard. And what does this have to do with the breach? Phyllis. Everything. These guys were speeding through puzzles, memorizing commands almost instantly. We looked at the data. And these guys are as smart as primates. Smarter even than that. We tried teaching them how to read, how to write, and they picked it up in the blink of an eye. Leonard, I have documentation that says those creatures are no more intelligent than a common tree frog. Phyllis, that's what we thought at first. But this testing, it showed that we were dead wrong. They were writing coherent notes to us. They told us what their names were. We gave one of them an IQ test. It scored 127. These things are humans, trapped in the bodies of frogs. Leonard, so what led to their aggressive behavior then? Phyllis, I'm not sure. Thompson brought in this kid's book with some fairy tales in it. Seemed like they'd enjoyed it, but after that, they started getting angry with us. They were depressed. They wrote notes telling us that we had no right to keep them here, that they needed to be out in the world, they needed to be free. Leonard, what exactly did they expect to be able to accomplish if they were able to escape? Phyllis, I don't know. Leonard, okay, I believe we're done here. Phyllis, wait, before you go, can you tell me what happened to Thompson? Leonard, I'm sorry, he was killed in the breach. Stray bullet in the chest. Phyllis. That's a shame. He was going to bring them another story. 
End log. Closing statement. Due to the information revealed in the incident, I order all contained instances of SCP-3061 to be immediately terminated. They are now presenting a major obstacle to successful containment of an already dangerous object. 053. Addendum 5. Dr. has found that most samples of SCP-306 display wide-spectrum resistance to antifungals. Upgraded to Keter. Item number. SCP-386. Object Class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures No entry to the containment area is allowed without approval from Site Command. Containment area should not be connected to any outside systems beside an entry airlock. Seals and filters for the airlock must be checked daily and replaced as needed. Incendiary devices are to be placed inside the containment area with remote activation controls. In the event of containment failure, Incendiary devices are to be immediately detonated, and the site is to go into full lockdown for a period of one month to find and contain any spore leakage. The containment area is to be cleaned and repaired at least twice a year. Anything exciting the containment area must be scanned for SCP-386 spores. Any personnel entering into or working near the containment area must be in full hazmat gear with self-contained atmosphere. Description SCP-386 is a form of mushroom that appears to have highly regenerative processes and is highly resistant to physical damage. Single units of SCP-386 grow from individual microscopic spores. These spores grow and reach maturity within four days. Spores have been observed to grow without water, sunlight, or any form of nutrients and can remain viable even after exposure to high heat, vacuum, radiation, and extreme kinetic force. SCP-386 produces no hyphae, and the means by which it gathers the energy for growth is unknown. A mild acid, pH 4, appears to be secreted in small quantities by the cap, identification of which has been inconclusive. Attempts to damage or take samples from SCP-386 have met with limited success. Units of SCP-386 have a texture and weight similar to sponge, but are extremely difficult to cut, puncture, crush, grind, or otherwise physically damage. SCP-386 units can be compressed to one-tenth their original size, beyond which compression becomes almost impossible. Fire and extremely strong acids have been shown to break down SCP-386. However, the spores have proven resistant to such measures. SCP-386 emits between 50 and 100 spores every 10 days after reaching maturity. Fully grown SCP-386 do not appear to age or rot, with some specimens remaining viable after 122 years. Containment is difficult due to the constant reproduction and emission of microscopic spores. Outbreaks of SCP-386 can overrun areas in very short periods of time, and the buildup of spores and acidic secretions can render the area extremely hazardous to life. One of the dangers of SCP-386 arises from the inhalation of spores. These will grow and reproduce inside the lungs, causing suffocation, internal hemorrhaging, and death. The same is true of accidental ingestion of spores and their subsequent reproduction inside the digestive system. Spore introduction to the bloodstream results in severe internal hemorrhaging, trauma, and eventual death. Due to the microscopic size and extreme durability of spores, there is no cure for SCP-386 at this time. Notes on Recovery SCP-386 was recovered after reports of a sudden fungus outbreak in Michigan. Several years before this, a form of nematode had started infesting local crops and causing massive damage. Local farmers made a concentrated effort and eliminated 95% of the nematode population with pesticides. Shortly thereafter, a form of highly invasive mushroom began to sprout, immune to pesticides and very resilient to damage. Outbreaks were burned or buried, and generally ignored. 
Local law enforcement responded to a concerned citizen who reported that her neighbor had not been seen for several weeks. Police entered the residence, finding a massive amount of mushrooms covering most surfaces, with most localized in the bedroom. Human remains were found under a large pile of mushrooms, identified as the homeowner. Agents responded after reports that all the responding officers died under identical conditions, with mushrooms starting to spread at an exponential rate. Samples of SCP-386 were collected, and after several failed attempts at outbreak containment, the area was firebombed. Area was monitored, and a new outbreak incident occurred after four days. Full containment and sterilization was enacted, with five additional outbreaks occurring during this process. It has been determined that the species of nematode eliminated by local farmers was a major predator of SCP-386, the removal of which allowed the population explosion. Attempts to find surviving members of this species have been unsuccessful. Item Number SCP-407 Object Class Neutralized Special Containment Procedure At time of acquisition, SCP-407 was recorded within a compact cassette tape. Currently, SCP-407 is backed up as a digital audio file on Data Expunged. SCP-407 should not be allowed to play under any circumstances outside testing conditions, and only with the approval of O5. Testing of SCP-407 is to be done in completely soundproof environments. All tools and subjects must be sterilized to remove the presence of pollen, fungal spores, plant seeds, and as much bacterial life to the greatest degree possible to delay the negative effects of SCP-407. Description SCP-407 is a song in an unidentified language, seemingly sung a cappella. The voices are thought to be human. The tape containing SCP-407 was found with one track of approximately 30 minutes duration, though the abrupt ending suggests there may be more. The song has been described by all listeners as something along the lines of soothing, glorious, and beautiful. While SCP-407 is played, rapid cell generation seems to occur with an auditory radius. This effect seems to occur at the cellular level and does not require the subject to be able to hear the music. The changes seem to only affect multicellular organisms at first, but quickly begins to affect mitosis in single-celled organisms. During the first minute of exposure, all multicellular life forms seem to become healthier. Subjects suffering from malnutrition, scarring, physical injury, or chronic diseases or other medical conditions seem to become healthy within only a minute of exposure to SCP-407. This has been shown to cure Alzheimer's disease, Crohn's disease, brain and spinal cord injuries, and normally fatal infections or wounds, amongst other things. Interestingly, cancer does not seem to be affected, though the subject's physical condition was still vastly improved. During the second and third minute of exposure, Subjects start experiencing unnecessary unrestrained cell growth, manifesting in quickly advancing dermal growths. These growths seem to mostly be benign tumors and calcium and fat deposits, which though sometimes painful and disfiguring, are not life-threatening. During the fourth minute of exposure, increased bacterial and fungal growth occurs, creating conditions that grow increasingly dangerous for all exposed life even in their new healthier states. Respiratory and digestive problems are quick to arrive in most cases, and become steadily worse as time progresses. Past five minutes, the effects of SCP-407 seem to differ each trial. In all cases, trace elements of plants or fungus, as well as any animal life present, begin to grow and replicate uncontrollably, at varying rates, often shaping into new organisms. Full results have varied depending on the test, and on the objects present when SCP-407 is played. Addendum 4071 SCP-407 was found in the home of Professor who had recently returned from research in the Amazon regions of northern Brazil. Agents were first alerted to a possible SCP when data expunged. Addendum 
4072. The mold that eventually resulted from SCP 407's second test appears to be some sort of cordyceps fungi, noted to be similar to mold encountered by SCP 507. Due to fear of fulfilling a fate similar to that observed by 507, testing using SCP 407 has been limited to using only the first 20 minutes of the recording. Addendum 4073 Experiment Log 407 SCP-407 Test Notes Test 1 SCP-407 played for 28 minutes and 32 seconds. 1 D-Class Personnel Testing Area Unsterilized 25 seconds Subject reports taking a great liking to music and can be observed attempting to hum along. 45 seconds Subject reports her knee, which had been injured for years, is no longer hurting and is working well. 125. Subject begins doing push-ups. Subject is seemingly euphoric at her physical state. Subject looks younger and shows considerable growth in musculature. 3 minutes. Subject stops exercise, reports dizziness and stomach cramps. Subject begins scratching left arm. 3 minutes 40 seconds. Subject is suffering from uncontrollable diarrhea and appears to be in great pain. Dermal clavi are seen appearing on left arm. Small weeds are seen growing in various parts of the testing chamber. 4 minutes. Corns on subject's skin are seen spreading quickly throughout body, taking on a whitish hue. Subject communicates that she no longer feels pain. 4 minutes and 30 seconds. Subject's skin is completely covered in thick, uneven, calloused skin. Subject no longer communicating. Chamber floor and walls seeing advanced plant growth. 5 minutes 10 seconds. Subject no longer moving and is barely recognizable as skin disfigurement continues. D-class uniform on subject disintegrating for unknown reasons. 6 minutes 45 seconds. Subject is completely unrecognizable as human, appears as a large mound of calloused flesh. The subject's new form can be seen expanding and contracting slowly. Fern-like plants are seen growing on and around the subject. 7 minutes 10 seconds. Chamber completely covered in various weeds, plants, and ferns. Majority of species are not recognizable. 7 minutes 55 seconds. Foliage in chamber is extremely thick, many of the observed plants reaching the roof. Mound originating from original subject has grown larger and seen expanding and contracting rhythmically. 8 minutes 30 seconds. Plants begin taking on a yellow tinge, as if wilting. 10 minutes 30 seconds. All plant life within test chamber has died and quickly decomposed into mulch. Mound is still seen expanding and contracting and has grown about 2 meters wide and about the same in height. 11 minutes. A variety of molds and mushrooms are seen growing throughout the chamber on the mulch of the deceased plants. Large mouth-like openings, complete with observed sets of teeth, have appeared on the outside of the expanding and contracting mound in the middle of the test chamber. 13 minutes 30 seconds. Diversity of fungal life in chamber greatly increased. Fungal forms are seen growing upon one another and upon the mound originating from the primary subject, which is still seen expanding and contracting. 15 minutes. Hand-like structures seen growing in pairs on outside of mound. Fungal life in chamber still abundant. 16 minutes 10 seconds. Hand-like structures seem to have developed eyes. Soon after eyes open, the structures detach from central mound and become mobile. Hands are seen dragging themselves towards particular fungal species, breaking off pieces, and then dragging themselves and the pieces into the mouth-like holes. 18 minutes. Majority of fungal material disappearing as more and more hands feed fungal material into the central mound. 19 minutes 30 seconds. Various plant shoots are seen growing. All species are completely unrecognizable. Only remaining fungal growths are those on the chamber ceiling. Yellowish vapors are seen coming from the central mass. 21 minutes. 
One of the organisms formerly identified as a plant is seen to become ambulatory. Organisms appear to grow from small, stationary, pod-like plants into adult mobile forms, which use several barbed tendrils to drag themselves throughout the chamber. They are observed to scale both the walls and ceilings of the test chamber. Though about half the size of the hand-like organisms, the plant-like organisms seem to possess sharp mandibles, which they use to destroy and consume the majority of the hand-like beings. 23 Minutes Plant-like organisms begin devouring hand-like growths that continue growing from the central mound as soon as they develop a working eye. 23 minutes and 40 seconds. Plant-like organisms are seen feeding fungal material from ceiling into the mouths on the central mound. 26 minutes. Plant-like organisms seemingly breed sexually, using directly delivered pollen. Life in chamber seems to be limited to three surviving species. The mobile plant-like organisms, the fungal organism that continues to grow on the ceiling, and the central mound on the floor. 28 minutes 32 seconds. Tape ends. Data expunged. End test 1. Test 2. SCP-407 played for 28 minutes 32 seconds. Within chamber, 1 D-Class personnel, unsterilized. 25 seconds. Subject reports feeling soothed by the music and of feeling stronger and more invigorated. 45 seconds. Liver spots and scars previously seen are shown to disappear. 2 minutes and 20 seconds. Subject appears to have physically grown an inch. Increase in musculature is noticeable. 3 minutes and 40 seconds. Subject reports intestinal pain. 4 minutes and 20 seconds. Subject begins vomiting. From vomit, plants are seen growing and slowly rooting into the tile floor. 4 minutes and 50 seconds. Subject starts developing rashes and growths on skin. 5 minutes and 30 seconds. Heavy dermal disfigurement. Subject panting heavily, begging for help. Great pain reported. 6 minutes 10 seconds. Subject falls to the ground and ceases to move. 6 minutes 45 seconds. Subject's body is quickly covered in what is thought to be fungal infections. Plant growth is observed growing from the subject's mouth, then eye sockets. 7 minutes 30 seconds. Subject is by this time unrecognizable, covered in molds and plant shoots. Body bursts as a banana tree emerges from the subject's intestines and proceeds to grow to maturity within seconds. 8 minutes 45 seconds. Plant and fungal growth has begun to spread throughout the testing chamber. What appears to be moss and weeds cover the floor. 9 minutes 30 seconds. Several shoots, stalks, bushes, and even small trees have appeared. Banana tree is no longer recognizable. The tree has grown thick and is covered with foliage and fungal growth. 10 minutes 30 seconds. The air is heavy with pollen and spores. Vision into testing chamber is difficult. 11 minutes 30 seconds. Movement is heard within the chamber. Several different small insect-like creatures are observed. Creatures are seemingly made of plant matter. 17 minutes and 30 seconds. For the last six minutes, creatures made of plant matter have been observed to rapidly generate, grow to maturity, kill and eat other creatures, and then be eaten themselves. Creatures increasingly progressing in size as time increases. 19 minutes. Medium-sized mammalian creatures are observed. They seem humanoid and bear a resemblance to initial subject. 21 minutes. Large fungal stalk is observed to grow from one of the mammalian creatures. Stalk end bursts, dispensing white spores. 22 minutes. Plant growth is still lush, but everything begins to become coated by a layer of mold. The plant creatures seem to die slowly for an unknown reason, before being covered by the mold. 23 minutes. Mammalian creatures are the last to succumb. They heavily decay and become covered in the same mold. Bodies are shown to contract and expand as if breathing. Stalks quickly rise from the bodies, 
burst with spores, and then just as quickly rot. 28 minutes 32 seconds. Tape ends. No change in chamber since the appearance of the mold. Chamber undergoes rigorous antibiological cleansing. Samples of the mold were taken. See Addenda 4071-4072. End Test 2. Addendum 4074. SCP-407 has been deleted from the system by what is now known to the Foundation as the Interest Group, Serpent's Hand. All known backup copies of SCP-407 have also been deleted. Refer to the following Incident Report X-23. Security Breach Incident X-23 On date expunged, SCP Site-19 breached by operatives from an organization known to the Foundation only as the Serpent's Hand. Site-19 Breach the breach of Site-19 seems to have been the second of two break-ins into SCP properties by known to the Foundation as L.S. This individual was responsible for a previous security breach, having coordinated the theft of SCP-268. Though data expunged, it is evident from video surveillance that SCP-268 was involved in this infiltration. The intruder known as L.S. seems to have simply walked into Site-19. The intrusion seems to have been for the purpose of using SCP-914. Knowledge of the intruder's use of SCP-914 can only be assumed due to the intruder's interruption of Dr. during routine testing. Dr. seems to have been data expunged, resulting in the intrusion's only personnel casualty. SCP-407 seems to have been deleted from the Foundation system during this time, so it can only be assumed the individuals involved are responsible. Whether this means the file has been completely destroyed, or possibly in the hands of this rogue group, is unknown. A short printed note was found in SCP-914's chamber. This note is the only insight the Foundation currently has of the group responsible for this incident. Document X-23-1 Dear Sirs of the Foundation, Behind guns and protocol you hide. Desperately chaining the ineffable, yourselves stuck within your own self-wrought pitiful cages of fear and ignorance. You think yourselves the shepherd, guarding the flocks of the unwise over the night. But you are so shaken by doubt and fear, that in your bewildered arrogance, you would vainly seek to chain the sun itself unto the heavens, to hold back the daily night. The delivering angels themselves you contain with three digits and four walls. Do you not see the blindness with which you walk and swing your blade? On the final day, would you have us contain Black Surtur himself with measures and science, and condemn ourselves to rotten stagnancy as you hold back his pure cleansing fires? I do not ask you not to act, but act with enlightenment and heart. Neither should one be seduced by the dark, nor blinded by the light, but walk firmly in the twilight and gaze unto all realms. Walk the world of fire with bare feet, and you will find yourself without the scars you never knew you had. Alas, in your fears, you fail to see the old gods that we all are, and unable to accept this sovereignty, detain both thought and essence of those that would take man beyond the mundane. Do not be so eager to hold back the tides of unrelenting destruction, that you trample what brave weed that would dare grow in the monochrome world you wish to pave. Such blind order stifles chaos, and what is chaos but life? I leave you with one final truth. The garden is the serpent's place. The divinities of fear and order who come to walk in the cool evening air are only visitors. Do not fail to see the evil hiding in the light, nor the aromatic beauty of the palest flower of darkness. Signed sincerely, L.S. P.S. You'll thank me for deleting what you call 407. Item Number SCP-522 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-522 should be kept in an airtight room with adequate light sources. Hazmat suits are strongly advised as anyone leaving the room must go through a thorough decontamination process, 
to prevent the potential spread of SCP-522. Once every two weeks, one pig, or animal of equivalent body mass, is to be placed at the center of SCP-522. Except for purposes of experimentation, at no point should any person stand on SCP-522 while alone inside the enclosure. For this reason, all personnel entering SCP-522's containment room should be accompanied by another person. Description SCP-522 appears to be a square swatch of red carpet, approximately 3.5 meters on each side. However, when a human being stands atop it, SCP-522 wraps itself around the victim with surprising speed. Once the victim has been completely enfolded, thousands of hair-like protrusions extend from the surface of the carpet and dig into the victim's skin, quickly draining them of blood over the next few minutes. After draining the victim's blood, SCP-522 unwraps and attempts to return to its original position, leaving the blanched victim in a heap at its center. Further investigation into the structure of SCP-522 indicates that it is a normal red carpet that has been infested by a previously unknown form of fungus or slime mold. This raises the possibility that there may be other copies of SCP-522 in the wild and necessitates the decontamination procedures to prevent any accidental spreading of spores on site. Furthermore, the red coloring of the carpet is simply just that. The color of the carpet having nothing to do with the organism or the task it performs. Theoretically, SCP-522 could live in a carpet of any color, undetected to the naked eye. Of additional note, SCP-522 appears to possess a rudimentary amount of intelligence. If another individual is present within the room, it will not attack, unless it is in a position to overwhelm both people at once. Current observations show that it is also patient. How long it can go without feeding is currently unknown. See experimental log for more details. SCP-522 was discovered during a murder investigation in the town of when one of the investigating officers fell prey to its effects. The mysterious coincidence of two people being utterly drained of blood within the same building prompted the Foundation to investigate, at which point SCP-522 was discovered. The Foundation is currently assessing the viability of using SCP-522 as a covert assassination tool. Research into breeding additional copies of SCP-522 pending approval. Experimental Log Experiment 1 1 D-Class Personnel Placed on the center of SCP-522 Results Once security left the room, the SCP-522 immediately wrapped up and around the subject. Subject could be seen thrashing through the underside of the carpet. Total exsanguination occurred after minutes, at which point, the carpet released the drained victim and returned to its original state. Experiment 2 2 D-Class personnel, both placed at the center of SCP-522. Results SCP-522 engulfed both subjects. Total exsanguination occurred after minutes. Experiment 3 2 D-Class personnel, one placed at the center of the SCP-522, the other placed at the exterior edge. Results Even after security left the room, SCP-522 remained in its dormant state. Experiment terminated after six hours of no activity. Experiment 4 2 D-Class personnel, one placed at the center of the SCP-522, the other placed off SCP-522 entirely. Results Even after security left the room, SCP-522 remained dormant. Experiment terminated as per previous. Experiment 5 1 D-Class personnel, placed at the center of SCP-522. SCP-522 fastened to floor with carpet staples. Results SCP-522 rips upward with surprising force, pulling carpet staples from floor. Total exsanguinating occurred in same time span as Experiment 1. Carpet attempted return to dormant state, but staples remained free. Experiment 6 1 D-Class personnel, placed at the center of SCP-522. 
A heavy desk was placed at the exterior edge. Results. SCP-522 pulled itself out from under the desk and engulfed the subject. After draining subject of all blood, it managed to wedge itself back into its original position, slipping beneath the desk. Experiment 7. One rat, placed at the center of SCP-522. Results. SCP-522 engulfed the rat. Total exsanguination occurred in seconds. Note from Dr. You mean we could have been using animals all along? Damn it! Disposing of the remains would have been much easier if I'd known that earlier. Experiment 8. Two rats. One placed at the center of SCP-522. The other placed at the opposite side of the enclosure, acting as an observer. Results. SCP-522 engulfed the rat placed upon it, despite the presence of the observer rat. Note from Dr. Curious. The only difference between Experiment 4 and Experiment 8 are the species of the subjects in question, yet we see two totally different results. This bears further investigation. Experiment 9. One rat, placed at the center of the SCP-522. One D-Class personnel placed off to the side, acting as an observer. Results. SCP-522 remains inert. Experiment 10. One D-Class personnel, placed at the center of SCP-522. One rat, placed off to the side as an observer. Results. Total exsanguination occurred in minutes. Seconds. It seems to be getting faster. Note from Dr. It appears SCP-522 is able to determine whether or not a person is in the immediate vicinity. How it makes the determination as to when it is safe to act has yet to be determined, but it does not seem to realize that we're observing it with the cameras. End Experimental Log Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.